Well, we are quickly approaching the end of our in-depth study of the first five books of the Bible. And I'm sure many of you have now fully grasped just how important it is to our faith in Christ that it is set in the foundation upon the Torah. And to set the New Testament that presents us with our Messiah on top of that. Yet I also know from talking with some of you that this has been anything but an easy path of discovery. That at times it's been painful to realize that in the past we've often relied on agenda-driven doctrines as the checkpoints of our faith rather than on the Word of God as it stands. I also know that others of you may remain at least somewhat unconvinced of the continuing validity of the Law of Moses that forms a goodly part of the Torah. Others of you are terribly uncomfortable with the smirks and the words directed your way from those who think uh, you've turned against the long-cherished beliefs of the mainstream church or that you may even have watered down your trust in Jesus Christ and instead are adopting some outdated form of self justification that's proved ruinous to many Jews for over 2,500 years. I ran across something recently that, that might ease that discomfort for some of you and uh, do something else for the remainder of you. Validate what you've learned and give you enthusiasm and joy and commitment to learn even more of the original testament of the Bible despite the efforts of many to derail you. Now, one of the scores of sources that I use to create these lessons is the word biblical commentary. I think I can say without much risk of disagreement that within the realm of Christian academia, this commentary series ranks as the best and most complete work of Bible research and exegesis accomplished in the 20th century. And no single work has surpassed it. This commentary series consists of 52 volumes, totaling well over 30,000 pages. It has been written and edited by the best minds of Christianity's elite theologians and scholars. And what makes it unique is not only the depth of every volume, but the mixture of specialized fields of each of the contributors. This is neither a liberal-oriented nor a conservative-oriented uh, series. It simply attempts to reveal to laymen and clergy the most up-to-date understandings gleaned from the Bible in a straightforward manner, but without glossing over difficulties or applying allegory to solve them. The writer of the two-volume Deuteronomy study that approaches 2,000 pages in length is Dwayne L. Christensen. Now, Dr. Christensen has a very well-rounded background. He received his first training from the American Baptist Seminary, then advanced training at MIT, then he was on to Harvard for his Doctor of Divinity, and next he added to those accomplishments a long stint at the pontificate University at Rome, and then finally, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Sounds like Baruch, doesn't it? Now, I tell you all this to demonstrate that what I'm about to quote to you comes from a very studied Gentile Christian scholar who was trained from a variety of theological viewpoints and who is considered one of the greatest living authorities on the Old Testament. So I want you to bear with me, please, as I quote to you a paragraph or two from his second volume on the Word Biblical Commentary Study of Deuteronomy. Dr. Christensen says this, Deuteronomy chapters 33 and 34 are the traditional readings in the synagogue liturgy for Simchat Torah. A lot of you know what that is, but it's the celebration that occurs among Jews when the annual cycle of the reading of the Torah from beginning to end has come to a close. And he goes on to say, Christians would do well to recover some of this joy of the Torah in public worship. Many have misread the teaching of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. 
When Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, but I say to you. In the book of Matthew, he was not replacing the Torah. He was merely challenging the manner in which the Torah was being interpreted in rabbinic circles of his day. Jesus was interpreting the text as it was written. For when properly interpreted, there's nothing there that is contrary to his own gospel message. He continues, The Torah is a way of life. It is a source of meaning and joy to Jew and Christian alike. The Torah was not intended to be something external to us, which only the highly trained specialists could understand. The Torah was to be learned by every member of the community, and the message is exceedingly practical. Jesus summed up the matter well when he, asked, when he was asked, Which commandment in the Torah is the greatest? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets. The law, the Torah, and the prophets to which Jesus referred on this occasion make up fully one half of the Christian Bible as we know it today. All of it is built on these two primary teachings of Deuteronomy. We would do well to become more familiar with the words of the Torah as a guide to proper living in the very manner in which Jesus lived and taught his disciples. What better way to do this than to include once again the systematic public reading of the Torah within the context of Christian worship? That is a great summation, if you ask me. Well, in this sloganized world we live in, Christians enjoy wearing wristbands that ask the question, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And Dr. Christian answers that, Christensen answers that question in the most fundamental way by saying that Jesus would encourage us to live the Torah life, to teach us the Torah principles. Rest assured that we are doing exactly that, as imperfectly as it may be, and you are part of nothing less than a latter-day revival within the church to bring back the Word of God, all of it, and to make that the center of our lives in worship. But it is also meant for us to learn to discern and then to discard all of which is not of God, but which is only of men. What it takes is a willingness to be molded and shaped by the Lord. That divine shaping includes pruning. It means having things removed from us that are dead and dying. But those things are typically so warm and familiar and comforting. But they need to be replaced with new and vibrant growth. As Dr. Christensen says so eloquently, what better way could there possibly be than for a believer to get into the Torah and see it for what it is, the way of goodness and life as defined by the Creator? Make no mistake, the Torah is not there to save us. Yeshua does that. But once we're saved and redeemed by His atoning blood, what else could our proper response be but now to serve Him through obedience? And where else can we find what obedience amounts to other than in His written word? And if we look to our own hearts as the source of His will for our lives, or we search out men's philosophies, no matter how outstanding they may sound, for the borders and the boundaries we should live within so that we can dwell in harmony with Jehovah, then we're going to be drinking from a thoroughly muddied water supply. Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 33, please. Deuteronomy chapter 33. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, that's on page 238.
We're going to read the whole chapter. This is the blessing that Moshe, Moses, the man of God, spoke over the people of Israel before his death. Adonai came from Sinai, and from Seir he dawned on his people, shone forth from Mount Paran, and with him were myriads of holy ones. At his right hand was a fiery law for them. He truly loves the peoples. All his holy ones are in your hand, st sitting at your feet. They receive your instruction. The Torah Moses commanded us, commanded us as an inheritance for the community of Jacob. Then a king arose in Yeshurun when the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. Let Reuben live and not die out, even though his numbers grow few. Of Judah, he said, Hear Adonai the cry of Judah. Bring him in to his people. Let his own hands defend him. But you help him against his enemies. Of Levi, he said, let your Tumim and Urim be with your pious one, whom you tested at Massah, with whom you struggled at Meribah Spring. Of his father and mother, he said, I don't know them. He didn't acknowledge his brothers or children, for he observed your word and he kept your covenant. They will teach Jacob your rulings, Israel your Torah. They will set incense, be set incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Adonai, bless his possessions, accept the work he does, but crush his enemy's hip and thigh. May those who hate him rise no more. Of Benjamin, he said, Adonai's beloved lives securely. He protects him day after day. He lives between his shoulders. Of Joseph, he said, may Adonai bless his land with the best from the sky for the dew, for what comes from the deep beneath, with the best of what the sun makes grow, with the best of what comes up each month, with the best from the mountains of old, with the best from the eternal hills, with the best from the earth and all that fills it, and the favor of him who lived in the burning bush. May blessing come on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. His firstborn bull, glory is his. His horns are those of a wild ox. With them he will gore the peoples. All of them to the ends of the earth. These are the myriads of Ephraim. These are the thousands of Manasseh. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, as you go forth, as you, Yissachar, in your tents. They will summon peoples to the mountain and there offer righteous sacrifices. For they will draw from the abundance of the seas and from the hidden treasures of the sand. And of Gad, he said, Blessed is he who makes Gad so large. He lies there like a lion, te tearing arm and scalp. He chose the best for himself. When the princely portion was assigned, and when the leaders of the people came, he carried out Adonai's justice and his rulings concerning Israel. Of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion cub leaping forth from Bashan. Of Naphtali, he said, you Naphtali, satisfied with favor, full of blessing from Adonai, take possession of the sea in the south. Of Asher, he said, may Asher be most blessed of sons. May he be the favorite among his brothers and bathe his feet in oil. May your bolts be of iron and bronze and your strength last as long as you live. Yeshurun, there is no one like God, riding through the heavens to help you, riding on the clouds in his majesty. The God of old is a dwelling place with everlasting arms beneath. He expelled the enemy before you and he said, destroy. So Israel lives in security. The fountain of Jacob is alone in a land of grain and new wine where the skies drip with dew. Oh, happy are you, Israel. Who is like you, a people saved by Adonai, your defender helping you in your sword of triumph. Your enemies will cringe before you, but you will trample down their high places. The Song of Moses of Deuteronomy 32 and the Blessing of Moses that we just read here in chapter 33 together forms what amounts to Moses' last words to the people of Israel. It can't help but be noticed, though, that there's a rather sharp contrast between the messages of those two poems. 
The Song of Moses, again, chapter 32, is essentially the history of Israel's redemption. And redemption revolves around God's justice system. It is full of warnings. It presents a dark future for Israel if they follow the nearly inevitable path of idolatry and rebellion against God. The blessing of Moses, however, as we just read in chapter 33, presents the possibility and the hope of a happy future, full of abundance, godly prosperity. And it does so within the framework of a series of prophetic pronouncements concerning each tribe of Israel separately. Now this encouraging and upbeat message presents a side of Moses that Israel likely never saw before this moment. He had spent the past 40 years of his life trying to guide a people who resisted that leadership at every step. He presided over giving of the Torah and the carrying out of the law during that entire time using the stick far more than the carrot because the disposition of those stubborn people he governed required it. The people saw Moses as the one who rebuked them, instructed them, and just as with our modern criminal law system, those who are in charge of dispensing justice deal almost exclusively with the prosecution and punishment side of the equation. Blessings that come from the system of American jurisprudence manifest itself mainly as the absence of punishment. And it doesn't include rewards for doing right. Most times God handed out the blessings and Moses handed out the consequences for misbehavior. God made the law, Moses enforced it. Is it any wonder that after years in the desert leading this reticent nation of three million souls, that Moses angrily struck a boulder to bring forth water instead of speaking to it when Israel was thirsty and far from any other known water source. Moses longed for a little credit, just a bit of gratitude, just a little, not too much, for making these Hebrews' lives easier. But instead, he was usually the recipient of the daily griping and complaining for making Israel toe the mark, a mark that he didn't set up. It was set up by the Lord. It seems as if Moses was always the bearer of dire divine warnings and the agent of God's curses. He was always sober. He was serious as his assignment and purpose was such a great burden upon those all too human shoulders. So for him to be able to give a farewell address that spoke only of hope and joy and blessing and, and a wonderful future. This was a great relief to him. And the people likely wondered who that man was that was speaking to them in such a way now after all this time. Moses had been the parent of Israel for the past 40 years, and thus he had to act the part. But as Joshua was about to pick up the baton of leadership and assume the role of Israel's stern father figure, Moses could transform into Israel's kindly grandfather. And he could enjoy Israel for the last few hours of his life. Those who are grandparents know exactly what I'm speaking about. And those who have not yet attained such a blessing from God might not get that. Parents are the heavies in a family. It's the parents' responsibility to order structure, to lay out boundaries for their children. Fathers and mothers must establish rules, then follow through by being sure they are obeyed. They're also the ones who execute the punishments for violations. And these rules are being laid down to little people 
who inherently can't wait to test them. And typically, they don't much like the rules no matter what they are. Unfortunately, it's the norm that because of this dynamic, parents must demand more respect than love from their offspring. And usually in order to attain that respect, the child must acquire a healthy measure of the fear of consequences for crossing paths with the all-powerful lawgiver, dad. Grandparents, on the other hand, well, we're more relaxed about this whole process of dealing with bringing up children. We finally have a little better handle on what matters and what doesn't. We've seen it all. And our motto is, ah, this too will pass. Grandparents don't have to deal with either establishing discipline or carrying it out beyond perhaps withholding that second chocolate bar. We tend to take a rebellious child who thinks he can flush an entire unfurled roll of toilet paper down the commode, despite the same results for the ninth consecutive time, and tell them of the time that we washed a dozen of our father's best white dress shirts along with two fountain pens we forgot to remove from his pockets. Or we'll just stand around the corner where they can't hear us and endure their creativity as they hatch a plan to make a clubhouse complete with campfire out of the interior of grandma's minivan. Grandparents have a different perspective on life than a parent can afford to have. Moses was now the grandfather of Israel. And for a very brief time, he could look at Israel through eyes filled with adoration and hope and mercy and leave the worry and discipline to somebody else. The first verse makes it clear that it was not Moses who wrote down the words of this 33rd chapter because it speaks of Moses in the third person. It speaks of him in the past tense. This is written like a person recalling the Gettysburg Address after Lincoln had succumbed to his wounds. We find in this first verse an important but not heretofore used title for Moses. He's called here a man of God. In Hebrew, Ish Elohim. Some scholars say that this never before used title for Moses is proof that a Hebrew editor added the 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy a long time after Moses lived, but another explanation is much simpler. A man of God, an Ish Elohim, is just another way of saying a prophet. And we'll see several prophets in the Bible specifically called an Ish Elohim, a man of God. Now Moses held the unique office of mediator of Israel, but now that his time was over, it was appropriate to reveal another attribute of Moses and of his pronouncements. It is that the words he spoke were often prophetic. Moses indeed was a prophet. He was a man of God. Now the farewell address that Moses was about to speak looks very much like the great patriarch Jacob's deathbed blessing upon his sons, the tribes of Israel, as recorded in Genesis. And like Jacob's blessing, Moses' blessing takes on a number of forms. Some of the blessings resemble an ordination of the firstborn as the new national authority. Other blessings are uh, hope for a pleasant future. M most often these blessings are descriptions of the nature and character of the various tribes as they would be assigned their territories in Canaan and some were Petitions to Jehovah for their tribal destinies to be supernaturally insured and, and, and protected. Now appropriately, before Moses begins to pronounce his deathbed blessing upon his people, he gives credit where credit is due. 
to the glorious, unmatchable God who formed Israel and who has agreed to be their God and their Redeemer, their Savior. To best understand the purpose and context of the first several verses, we need to see that what is being described is the approach of Jehovah from the wilderness regions that are primarily south of the Promised Land. Now the picture painted for us is of Jehovah coming from the mountains of these southerly deserts in order to deliver Israel from the cruel hands of Egypt and then to redeem them unto himself as a people. Now therefore these passages speak of Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula and Mount Sinai, Seir, the region and the mountain, in the land of Edom, and despite the usual translation of Mount Paran, it is the mountains, plural, mountains of Paran that are being referenced. No specific mountain peak called Mount Paran has ever been identified. Next, there is a reference to a place called Ribevot Kodesh that appears in both the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. But it is not presented as a place in the Masoretic texts, so we won't find it characterized that way in the complete Jewish Bible. Ribot means myriads. So the title of the place is Myriads of Kodesh. Thus, the Masoretic text takes the phrase Ribot Kodesh and instead of making it a place, makes it into a phrase. Literally, myriads of holy ones thus giving us a mental picture of angelic beings. But this idea of God approaching the Promised Land from myriads of angels, when the entire passage is about the desert regions Israel traveled through Canaan uh, through to get to Canaan, just doesn't fit. Almost for sure, this is speaking of an area, area near Kadesh. It's not speaking of angels. Since Kadesh is located in the wilderness of Paran, right at the border of Seir. Well, for the next several verses in Deuteronomy 33, the various Bible translations can look substantially different from one another. This blessing of Moses is filled with odd phrases that have baffled the language scholars, and that are even a couple, there are even a couple of Hebrew words here that appear nowhere else uh, in the Bible, leaving their meaning very much in doubt. Further, some of the phrases seem out of place, at times a little out of context. So Bible translators and interpreters have had a really difficult time here. Now we're not going to get into all the possibilities of their interpretation because even the ones that are the most accepted are just a consensus of speculations. This is one of those times when it seems that even the earliest Bible documents at our disposal have had the text of these particular verses corrupted, mostly in just a minor way such as a misspelling that went unnoticed for copy after copy, uh, more likely was a basic Hebrew translation problem. And this is because, and follow me here, those of you that have studied a little Hebrew, this is because the earliest Hebrew alphabet that sometimes goes by the name Proto-Hebrew didn't even include the Hebrew letters of Aleph, He, Vav, and Yod. Now, to help you understand what that means for us, I want you to imagine if the King James Bible had been written using a 22-letter English alphabet instead of the modern 26-letter English alphabet. Uh, this isn't the case, by the way. I'm just using it as an illustration, okay? And then someone attempts to convert the English words formed using only 22 letters and sounds into English words that normally employ 26 letters and sounds. Well, much of the time, it would be reasonably doable, could produce reasonable results. At other times, it would leave us with strange words and phrases that would make very little sense to us. So while the conversion from the most ancient Hebrew alphabet to the more modern took place maybe 3,000 years ago, the transliterated but odd sounding phrases that we have here in Deuteronomy 33 would have had an understandable meaning passed down by tradition 
to the Hebrews of that age. But when you take it more literally, because the tradition of its intended meaning has been lost, we have a real hard time making any sense of it. So we're just not going to linger here. Now I will make one brief comment, however. In verse 5, we run again into the strange epithet of Yeshurun, as it's referring to Israel. Now it literally means the upright one. And the idea being expressed in these verses, despite the many variations of the precise wording, is that among Yeshurun, Israel, a king arose. And it happened during a gathering of the leadership of Israel. Now this cryptic comment is remembering the day that God was made king of Israel by the tribal leaders of, uh, of Israel at the covenant acceptance ceremony at Mount Sinai. Recall that all that the people of the Exodus said that instead of Israel having a human king as all their neighbors had, they wanted God to be their king. And the reason for this collective decision was a very noble one in the hearts of some Israelites, not so noble in the hearts of others. Many Israelites trusted Jehovah had at least some inkling of his power and his sovereignty, and so sincerely they wanted the Lord to govern them through their mediator Moses, thinking that's the best way to go about it. Now others just didn't want any leader over them with the power of a king. They had just escaped from the king of Egypt, so the thought of setting another king over them, more or less at their own doing, was more than they could bear. And further, while the Israelites may have accepted the concept of the need for a human king over them. It's hard to imagine that the leaders could have ever settled on which of those 12 tribes would have the honor of providing that king. Tribalism then as now looks to the welfare of its own members above that of any other tribe. Therefore, the tribe that the king comes from always gets special care, additional protection, extra favor, and a much greater share of power. Thus, there is never-ending tribal maneuvering that often leads to outright war among tribes to be the dominant one that produces the king or the ruler of the region. The wars that we hear about today in the Middle East and in Africa are essentially tribal and or sectarian. That is, they are Muslim versus Muslim, Muslim versus Christian, or extended family versus extended family. Beginning with King Saul, right up until the Romans conquered Israel, we read in the Bible a litany of conspiracies and murders among the tribal leaders of Israel as they vied for power once they decided they would rather have a human king than a divine one. The world is in turmoil today because it rejects the God of Israel. Instead, it wants to continue on our, on our rather unsuccessful path of governing ourselves by means of flawed human leadership. Well, let's move on to verse 6 that begins the list of individual blessings that Moses pronounces upon the tribes of Israel. And the first tribe mentioned is Reuben. Now, interestingly, the very place Moses was standing at the time of this blessing was in Reuben's territory. Reuben and Gad and approximately half of the clans that together formed the tribe of Manasseh settled on the east side of the Jordan River, the so-called Transjordan. On the one hand, it's logical that Reuben would be the first tribe mentioned because he was Jacob's firstborn son. Yet nearly three centuries earlier, Jacob had removed the firstborn rights of inheritance traditionally due to Reuben because he had sexual relations with Jacob's concubine, Bilah. So instead, that firstborn inheritance was split into two parts. One part of it went to Judah. The other part went to Joseph. Now, technically, it went to Joseph's son, Ephraim. Judah was given the right to rule over Israel, while Ephraim 
was given the double portion part of the firstborn blessing, meaning wealth and abounding fruitfulness above all of his brothers. <clears throat> the blessing is in the form of a plea to the Lord that the tribe of Reuben would live and not die, meaning that Reuben would, wouldn't become extinct through absorption of it by another tribe of Israel or by Reuben being conquered and assimilated into a foreign culture. Now if we follow the fortunes of the tribe of Reuben into the future, we'll find that indeed it would survive as a separate tribe well into the time of the judges. And it also was mentioned in the earliest era of the kings. But Reuben becomes almost an afterthought after that. Reuben became insignificant as a tribal entity, meaning that its population diminished greatly and so it lost any meaningful political power. Now because we Westerners have such a meager conception of how tribalism operates, I want to interject that what I have just described as happening to Reuben was a normal and usual ebb and flow among tribal societies. Tribes don't just disappear. Typically, their numbers drain off into a rival tribe, more often than not due to intermarriage. There was nothing supernatural about a large tribe becoming small or a small tribe becoming large through some kind of a, a political or economic circumstance. Perhaps a trade route that ran through their territory became popular so they'd collect taxes and tolls. Or a tribe might control a seashore that is shipping developed would become an ideal port as a major trade highway so that tribe would become wealthy merchants. On the other hand, a tribe like Dan could find itself living on the border of an aggressive people like the Philistines and be no match for them. Therefore, a tribe's fortunes could rise and fall and then with it rode power and prestige or maybe even extinction. Not extinction in the sense that the genes of that tribe were eradicated, but rather extinct as a separately identified tribal entity with its own government, its own leaders. A tribe is, after all, merely people that form a large extended family. And when a tribe began to lose its grip, and the people of that tribe recognized there was no foreseeable hope that their own tribe would remain viable, many of its members would consider ways to solve the problem as it pertained to them personally. And one way was for their daughters to marry into the larger and more powerful tribes. Another was for a family to simply migrate into another tribal territory and live there. Living there didn't automatically make them a member of another tribe, but it did add to the economic and military strength of the tribe whose territory they now lived in, simply by the addition of more people, just as it lessened the economic and military strength of the migrating family's own tribe and tribal regions. So a tribe was usually quite amenable to accepting peaceful newcomers. And we find this exact thing happening to the tribes of Israel. But as opposed to other of the world's tribes, Israel's tribes had their futures more or less predestined by the Lord at the bedside of Jacob. And those destinies are being reaffirmed here in Deuteronomy by Moses. Well, the next tribe addressed is Judah. Now, before we discuss Judah, a logical question to ask is what the rationale is, or if there is even a rationale, for the order of the tribal listing in this blessing of Moses, because there is not a consensus, but rather is it, it is clear that neither military battle order, that's illustrated by how the tribes were set into groups of three around the, the wilderness tabernacle, nor birth order is involved in this. Even though Reuben is mentioned first, Judah is next, and it's certainly not the second child born to Jacob. And even though Leah's first four children are mentioned first, the order gets confused after that. 
Jeffrey Tigay says that one needs a map opened up before us to understand the order of the tribes as presented here, and that that order has to do with geography and with the boundary lines that are assigned to each tribal region. Beginning with Reuben, the territory where Moses is currently standing, the next tribe mentioned is Judah, where the Israelites first cross into the Promised Land. Then after Levi, the order of tribal blessings follows a path that heads northward through Benjamin, then into contiguous regions of Ephraim and Manasseh, those are the two Joseph tribes, then next Zebulun and its neighbor to the east, Yisachar. Continuing east, we watch the blessing order in Deuteronomy 33 cross back over the Jordan into the Transjordan region and into the territory of Gad, then north to Dan, south from Dan to Naphtali, and then finally westward to Asher. Levi, which was given no territory, is dealt with in between the blessings given to Judah and Benjamin, undoubtedly, because this was the area where Jerusalem would one day exist, and where the priests of Levi would serve at the great temple. Now Judah, the ruling tribe, out of which the Messiah would come, is given a blessing that seems to foresee a time of war, and the need for the Lord God to hear the prayers of Judah, aid it in its battles, and then bring the soldiers back home to their families. The word used to describe the way in which Judah beseeches the Lord and in which the Lord hears Judah is a very familiar one to us. Shema. Shema. And Shema means to listen and obey, or listen and take action. It does not indicate the passive act of just listening and just intellectually understanding the plea, but going no further. Up to this point in the Torah, the plea has been for Israel to Shema, hear and obey God. Now the plea is that God would Shema, hear and act on Judah's behalf when they call on him for help. Next, the Levites are addressed. And since the Levites are God's own set-apart priests, the blessing is focused around their role in society as the teachers of God's law and officiators of the all-important rituals. For only the fourth time in the Bible, the Urim and Tumim stones are mentioned. These were the two stones stored in a special pouch that was attached to the breastplate of the Israelites' high priest, and they were used to determine God's will in certain matters. Now, how exactly they were used, how it is they indicated the divine decision has been lost over the centuries. Even the precise meaning of the words Urim and Tumim are in doubt. Some think that the names are indicative of the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. What is self-evident is that the type of answer that the Turim, uh, Urim and Tumim could give would either be limited to a yes or a no. So it's totally binary. Nevertheless, the plea from Moses is that the honor of using the Urim and Tumim would remain in the hands of the Levites. That's the faithful ones of verse 8. And that God would continue to reflect his will through the use of those two stones when he deemed it appropriate. Now, after the subject of the Urim and Tumim, Moses refers to the Levites as those who were tested at Massah and Meribah. In other words, it makes the Levites as those who were the real objects of the Lord's testing at the wilderness stops of Meribah and Massah. If we look back at Exodus 15, 24, and 25, we see this. The people grumbled against Moses and asked, What are we to drink? And Moses cried to Adonai, and Adonai showed him a certain piece of wood, which, when he threw it into the water, made the water taste good. There Adonai made laws and rules of life for them. There he tested them. So the idea is that while all Israel went through this ordeal, it was actually the Levites who were being measured by the Lord to see if they were the right choice to be his personal priests. Now, as is more common than you might suspect in the Bible, there are two word plays that occur in verse 8. 
Masa means testing place. Meribah means challenge place. So the words of this passage are whom you tested at the testing place and challenged at the challenged place. I only point this out so you can begin to see that the names of places and locations in the Bible are almost always established by something of significance that happened there or is due to some outstanding feature of the place, like Beersheba, which means seven wells. Therefore, over the centuries, a place name might get changed as one culture who has named the place for a significant happening within their history gives way to another and a newer, newer culture that has something of a different significance happen at that same place, and so they rename it. Now, verse 10 is essentially the result of what happened with Levi as recounted in verse 9, and it harkens back to that golden calf incident back in Exodus 32. And even though it was Aaron who actually led the rebels in molding the graven image of the calf, it was also Aaron and his family, when confronted by Moses for this horrific sin, who saw their error. And they stood with Moses against those who went right on worshiping the calf. Moses and Aaron, now being Levites, it was natural that members of their tribe, Levi, would also come and stand with them. But not all the Levites did. The result was that the Lord ordered Moses and Aaron and the Levites who joined them to go about killing all Israelites who continued to bow down to that golden calf, <laughs> the one that Aaron built. And this including included putting to the sword many family members, including their own mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters. It was this act of repentance and their willingness to forsake that which meant most to them on the face of this earth, their immediate families, that merited them the honor of being chosen from among all the tribes of Israel as the Lord's set-apart servant tribe. Now, never one to miss showing you a good example of patterns being established in the Torah and then reoccurring in the rest of the Bible, I want you to listen to what Jesus said in Luke 14. At verse 25, large crowds were traveling along with Yeshua and turning, he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, his brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life besides, he cannot be my disciple. See where that idea came from now? Exodus 32 and Deuteronomy 33.8 form the context for that verse. This is not about the commandment to honor your father and mother. It is not about establishing an exception to that foundational principle. So hating your father and mother is not that we are to go out and kill our families if they commit idolatry or leave them if they don't agree with our newfound faith. Rather, it is that we are to be willing to let go of anyone or anything at the Lord's direction if we are going to follow Messiah. It is that we might have to make some very tough and heartbreaking choices. And Yeshua says to essentially make the same choice in principle that Aaron, Moses, and those who allied themselves to them made back in the days of the Exodus. And we'll continue with this chapter next week. Please rise. <laughs>